Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health. Good morning and welcome to another Ministry of Health's virtual media conference, which provides you with clear and accurate information on COVID-19. Today we have with us the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, Dr. Avery Hines, Director Epidemiology Division, Ministry of Health, and Mr. Lisha Baksh, CEO of the Northwest Regional Health Authority. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, and I will be your moderator for this morning's media conference. I invite the Honorable Minister to provide the overview and context to this morning's media conference. Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al. Good morning to Dr. Hines. Good morning to CEO Salisha Bash. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, members of the public, wherever you are, we thank you for tuning in, listening, and again, we thank the media for coming out this morning. My objective here this morning is a very simple one. We have noted the high numbers of persons turning out this morning for vaccinations in our centers. We may recall that the appointment system which we had instituted was not really working in the best interest, especially of our elderly. So we thought that we would move to a first come first serve basis, which they, many of them were asking for. This overwhelming response has created many issues across the health cent the 36 health centers across the country. In immediately reviewing what has happened this morning with the CEOs, security, and so on, the first thing I must do this morning is apologize to the nation for what has happened this morning. The Ministry of Health, of which I head, we underestimated the demand for vaccines, and we must sincerely apologize, and I, as Minister, sincerely apologize for this this morning. But coming out of this apology, we must learn some lessons. And immediately this morning, we are going to institute the following measure to mitigate against this reoccurring from tomorrow. From tomorrow, uh, Thursday the 10th, I believe, we will start an alphabetical system using surnames in groups of five. So from tomorrow, over 60 alone, we are only going to be handling persons over 60 with surnames starting from A to E will get into our health centers. On Friday, we will do F to J, and then we will communicate with the public, so on and so on. So we'll be having a rolling um, alphabetical listing in groups of five letters, A to E, F to G, to mitigate what happened today. So in moving forward, I want to thank the population for their overwhelming response to the vaccination drive. It does speak to a high level of vaccine acceptance. Again, thank the public for their overwhelming response. My apology is unreserved. And I have spoken to all the CEOs within the past half an hour or so. And most, if not all, of the crowds have already been handled and dispersed. And we will be moving to this um, alphabetical system from tomorrow. So, Al, that is my um, update here this morning. If I could use the opportunity also to just bring the country up to date on where we are with vaccinations in total. Um, as of yesterday, as of yesterday, we have vaccinated 134,000 289 persons with their first dose of vaccines. You may recall we started this process on Tuesday, April 7th, which was the Tuesday after the Easter weekend. So in about two months, we have vaccinated 134,289. We started the second dose of the vaccine rollout this Monday gone on June the 7th. 
You may recall we started off with 1,179, which was basically healthcare workers who were vaccinated using the 2,000 doses uh, gifted to us by the government of Barbados. But now we are moving in, in the phase for the general public, and that figure has moved from 1,179 to 4,228 in the past three days. So that is the update on where we are with vaccinations, and that is the update on the lessons that we have learned at the Ministry of Health um, in managing this high degree of vaccine acceptance this morning, and the lessons learned and the solutions implemented. Thank you very much, Al. And thank you, Minister. I now hand you over to Dr. Hines, who will present the latest clinical and epidemiological updates. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Good morning to the Honorable Minister, to my colleague, CEO Baksh. Good morning to the members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. Uh, if I may have the first slide. The clinical update begins as follows. As at, eight, as at 4 p.m. on the 8th, that is 4 p.m. yesterday, at both public and private facilities, we would have conducted 203,202 tests. This is COVID-19 tests. Out of those, 27,079 individuals would have tested positive between March 2020 and now. And of those individuals, 16,647 have already recovered. There are currently 9,833 9, total active cases, and those are broken down as follows. There are 8,934 persons currently in home self-isolation. There are 450 individuals in hospital and 169 in step-down facilities. There are currently 117 patients in the state and the state supervised quarantine facilities. And to date, there have been 599 deaths and we extend our condolences to the members of those families. In terms of occupancy in the parallel health system, the overall occupancy is at 60%, with Trinidad's occupancy being 65 uh, and Tobago 24. The ward level occupancy overall 57%, ICU 98%, HDU 96%. And uh, the vaccination figures have actually already been given by the minister with updated figures beyond 4 p.m. as at yesterday. So that the figures here were at four, and then the ones that came in afterwards uh, tally to the totals that have been shared. If we move to the next slide, I'll go straight into the epidemiological update. And as we have been following or tracking, the epidemic curve, which has grown uh, to quite some to quite some height in the month of May. We're seeing now that in the months of June, the first few days of those months, the figures, the numbers that are accumulating seem to be slightly less. They seem to be on that decline. So the month of May with the highest, um, the highest bars in gold, uh, showing a peak in the middle of May and then some slow decline thereafter. Uh, we're seeing where that, that curve is now beginning to show the signs of uh, somewhat consistent decrease from the middle of May move forward. We again continue to watch that as we ensure that we have all the retrospective data that um, may be accumulating. We make sure that all of that is into the system before we make a definitive statement on that. But at present, this is the trend that we're seeing, and this trend is uh, an encouraging one. Let's move to the next slide. If you look at this on a weekly as opposed to on a day-to-day -day basis, we do see that, uh, that similar trend where weeks 20 and 21 were just about the same height, so to speak, whereas the weeks previous, the weeks prior to that had gone higher and higher each week, each bar taller than the next. That week 20 and 21 we saw where that leveled out to some extent, and week 22 came in at a total that was a little lower, actually about 10% lower than week 21. We are hoping that we continue to see that decrease as we move through the current week, the, the current week being week 23. We'll continue to keep an eye on that trend. 
Next slide. Here we see the monthly uh, totals and uh, the other feature of both this slide and the one before is what we call that overall positivity. And what we are seeing with this uh, is that that background salmon colored area is now showing some the beginnings of a downward trend as well so that the number of samples that come back positive out of every 100 samples that we uh, that we test has now gone down to the high 30s mid 30s uh, right now low 30s in terms of the uh, number of samples coming back positive out of every 100 tests performed so this is another indicator of uh, uh, what we are hoping is a slowing and a decrease in the level of viral circulation within the population next slide please this slide shows the demographics that is the age and sex distribution of the positive cases main features of this being the almost even distribution of cases between men and women just about 50 50 50.6 50 percent men and that 25 to 49 year old age group uh, having the majority of the cases at this point in time the last slide is the slide representing the fatalities let's move to that one and what we do see here is that shift that we've been speaking about away from the 75 percent predominance of men down to just about 61 percent and the majority of the cases still being in the over 60 age group but about 35 percent or so of the cases being in individuals 60 and under key features key important things we want to remind individuals about with respect to the fatalities is that one of the recurring uh, themes is the presence of what we call comorbidities but there have been people who have not had any known comorbidities and have still had uh, adverse outcomes so we do want to encourage anyone who is having respiratory symptoms and begins to feel increasingly unwell to contact the health system as as quickly as possible contact the ambulance or they could go into the emergency room if need be but not to wait at home indefinitely while symptoms worsen we do encourage you to isolate yourself at home if you are mildly ill having respiratory symptoms of you know, soft sore throat etc and not deteriorating but if you start to feel any of the deterioration that has been described in terms of worsening shortness of breath faintness extreme fatigue these are signals immediately to reach out to the health system for additional support so we do want to encourage that uh, that behavior and while we are in the home self-isolation we do also want to encourage that the people who are being isolated maintain some of the precautions that the uh, in, within the home that we've been mentioning and that would include the use of the masks even inside the house opening of the windows keeping to one part of the house not sharing utensils not sharing uh, space so to speak and if there is a single bathroom then scheduling use in such a way that the ill person would use it last and then there's a clean down of the surfaces with just the usual household cleaners including household bleach and uh, that behavior will help to reduce some of the risk of transmission even within the household so i'm going to end the epidemiologic update there and turning back over to mr alexander and thank you dr hines as you are aware, vaccinations have been ramped up across all the regional health authorities, and we have been bringing you updates from the CEOs of the regional health authorities on the progress being made. This morning, we are pleased to welcome back the CEO of the Northwest Regional Health Authority, Ms. Bash, who will update us on the vaccination rollout across the NWRHA. Ms. Bash. Honorable Minister of Health, Mr. Terence Dial Singh. Dr. Avery Hines, Mr. Alexander, members of the viewing and listening public, members of the media, good morning. I've been asked to provide an update as it relates to the NWRHA's activities in regard to the COVID-19 uh, operations as well as our vaccination rollout. So I will deal firstly with our COVID-19 operations and then speak to our vaccination rollout activities. Uh, when I was last um, at the press conference, I would have provided an update to the public 
regarding the operationalization of the field hospital at the Jean Pierre complex. Since that time, we have done certain uh, changes and additions to the field hospital. Particularly, the original capacity of the field hospital was 28 beds. Uh, because of the increase in the COVID positive cases, we would have made a decision to uh, expand that bed capacity by adding on 16 additional beds. So at present, we have a total bed capacity of 44. And the new use of the field hospital will be as a step-down, step-up facility, which will be treating less acute patients. So the types of patients that will be admitted to this facility would be patients in our accident and emergency departments at both Port of Spain and uh, St. James Medical Complex, as well as admissions from our COVID-19 award, which is now located at the St. James Medical Complex. Uh, with respect to the St. James Medical Complex, uh, on or about May 28th, uh, a decision was made to operationalize a medical ward uh, that is located at the St. James Medical Complex for the purpose of treating our COVID-19 patients. Uh, the team would have worked countless hours over the long weekend of the Indian Arrival Day to operationalize this space within three days. And the ward was commissioned for use on June 1st, 2021. The capacity of this ward is 60 beds. However, due to our staffing, present staffing constraints, we are only able to appropriately manage 40 beds at this time. The purpose of, these, of this particular ward will be to treat our high acuity COVID positive patients. Now this 40 beds, it also includes five beds which will be dedicated to HDU and ICU patients. In an effort to also make this ward functional for the particular purpose, we also made a decision to utilize the St. James Health Center, which is located um, downstairs of the particular ward. Uh, to operationalize it and use it as an administrative area for all our categories of staff who would be designated and assigned to this particular ward. And in so doing, we would have redirected the regular health, health center services to various surrounding um, health centers such as the Woodbrook Health Center, Diego Martin and Pitti Valley. And the media and the public were advised of this redesignation of services uh, as we would have indicated in our, in our various media releases. Um, I wish to update the public to um, advise that both spaces, meaning the field hospital, as well as the COVID-19 ward at St. James Medical Complex, have been fully utilized on a continuous basis, and our medical team and ancillary team continue to provide care for our COVID-positive patients. As it relates to our vaccination rollout activities, uh, just to summarize, with respect to our first dose AstraZeneca, which would have been administered between the period of April 6th to May 4th or thereabout, we would have assigned four designated health centers for this purpose. And uh, the numbers vaccinated are disaggregated as follows. At the Barataria Health Center, 2,288 persons. Diego Martin, 2,517 persons, Carinage, 789, and Mova, 928. Now, with respect to Carinage and Mova, the, their numbers are lesser because they would have been um, added on to our vaccination health centers about a week or two after the commencement of the vaccination rollout. During that period as well, too, we would have operationalized the paddock, which was the country's first mass vaccination site. And over a seven-day period, we would have vaccinated 9,197 persons. So in totality, NWRHA, for the rollout of the first dose AstraZeneca vaccines, would have vaccinated 15,719 persons. Uh, as it relates to the administration of the first dose Sinopharm, which would have commenced on May 21st, we would have utilized the same four health centers, as well as added on three additional health centers to ensure that our catchment area had more accessibility to their first dose Sinopharm. So the numbers that were vaccinated from May 21st to June 8th, which is yesterday, are as follows. 
Jago Martin, 2,275 persons. Karanaj, 1,974. Baratario, 2,231. Mova, 1,535. And the three additional health centers are San Juan, and they vaccinated 1,056 persons over the period. Santa Cruz, 472. And St. James, 195. Now, St. James was only operating for three days because of the decision we took on May 28th to redesignate the, the space to accommodate our St. James Medical Ward for COVID positive patients. So, in total, with respect to our first dose AstraZeneca and first dose Sinopharm, we would have vaccinated 25,457 persons over the period of time. Uh, we have also taken a decision as we continue our first dose Sinopharm administration. We added on an additional site, Pitti Valley, which will now replace the St. James site. So we are, in essence, we would have seven active vaccination sites at present. And that uh, Pitti Valley Health Center has been commissioned to administer vaccines as at today. Uh, with respect to our second dose AstraZeneca, um, we have been um, administering those second doses at the paddock. So persons who would have been who would have received their first dose AstraZeneca at our health centers as well as the paddock would now be administered their second dose at the paddock as well too. Now, the second dose administration would have commenced on Monday, which was June 7. And for the first two days, we would have vaccinated 787 persons. And these persons would have been eligible to receive their vaccinations as they would have met the eight-week criteria from the date of their first dose. While we have been calling persons and giving them appointments for their second dose um, vaccines of AstraZeneca, the product, I want to encourage persons who have not received their calls or appointments, please visit the paddock eight weeks after receipt of your vaccine and you will be accommodated. We have published the dates, um, the due dates for persons second dose on our media pages. So you can visit our media pages to um, figure out what date would be um, your second dose administration. Uh, as it relates to the new model we would have adopt, uh, adopted this morning, as the Honorable Minister indicated about the walk-ins, um, we did anticipate a high level of vaccine acceptance. And uh, in an effort to um, manage the crowds that we would have been expecting, albeit we did not expect the, the numbers that we have seen this morning, these were the measures we would have put in place to have commenced this morning. At our designated health centers, we would have placed additional security officers at each site. We also li liaised with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to conduct regular patrols at each one of our health centers. As it relates to Baratari and San Juan, um, for persons who know their locations, they are located on side streets in communities and there isn't really much space around the area. So what we did, we partnered with the San Juan Laventil Regional Corporation, and we received approval for, to close off 7th Street, which is at the Barataria Health Center. So that street is now closed off to vehicular traffic. So therefore, persons can, uh, the pedestrians can have better access and safer access to the health center. At the San Juan Health Center, we were also given permission to close Queen Street to vehicular traffic. Uh, for the same purposes with respect to the pedestrian traffic. In addition, each member of our operations team have been stationed at each of our designated health center to oversee today's activities and to treat with any issues which may arise throughout the day. As we all know with every new model, there will be teething issues and it's, it's the norm with, every, with any initiative, but we are committed to treat with whatever issues that may arise. As a team, we normally meet at the end of every day to discuss whatever challenges would have been experienced at the day and to develop mitigating strategies in moving forward to ensure that we um, have the best possible service to our clientele. I wish to remind the members of the public that all staff have been working tirelessly since the beginning of this pandemic. 
and we are committed to vaccinate as many eligible persons as possible. So I just want to urge the public to be patient with us. Follow the instructions. We will improve as we continue each and every day. And together we will successfully navigate throughout this storm and we will return to some semblance of normalcy. So thank you for giving, be, being given the opportunity to provide this update today. Back to you, Mr. Alexander. Thank you very much, CEO Bash. We now move to, into the question and answer segment. Our media representatives are asked to pose their questions to members of the panel and state their name and media house. Because of that time is limited, we are requesting a maximum of two questions per media house. We begin with the Express. Good morning, Kim Bodram from the Express. Of course, addressing uh, what we saw this morning at the vaccination sites, the health centers. Minister, you you said that the crowds were, you did not, uh, as, you underestimated the amount of people that would have sought vaccines today. But you yourself did say yesterday at the Supermarkets Association launch in Shikwanas that you were not seeing the vaccine hesitancy that was being spoken about when you visited a lot of these sites. In fact, you noted that Diwali Nagar last week alone vaccinated more than 2,000 people. And those would have been people who were either able to get um, their appointment or given appointments through some other system. So can you give us an idea then of some of the logistics and the planning that would have gone into to today's launch, um, I mean, given those numbers alone, this was a mass call. How could it not have been anticipated that possibly double that number of people would have shown up? And was there a lack of a public campaign ahead of this walk-in situation to really press into the public who was eligible to turn up today? Also, some details seem to be missing to the public in terms of, you know, times, what's the best thing to do? It, it, was, it was just sort of an open call. Can we get some more details into that, some advice to the public on how to proceed with that, where, when to turn up, how to turn up? Even with this alphabetical order system coming in, that may still be a lot of people could cluster on mornings at some of these small sites. Can you also give us an idea of what the vaccine distribution is? Because we got a lot of complaints that some health centers only received 200 shots, 300 shots, and therefore hundreds of people were turned away. But our understanding is that some 20,000 Sinopharm vaccines are supposed to go into the health centers. I, I hope that was clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. So in launching a mass vaccination program, you are correct. There's a lot of logistics, a lot of planning um, at the Ministry of Health and at the level of the RHAs. Without, without making excuses, Many of the people who turned up, and the, and the CEOs could attest to this, are people who did who weren't eligible. And that was part of the issue, healthy persons under 60. That was a major part of the problem. But we must accept responsibility. And in accepting responsibility, we do now have to cut it off to persons over 60, unfortunately. Um, this will eliminate a lot of the overcrowding that you did see today uh, because many persons under 60 who did not have NCDs turned up. The alphabetical system, remember we're dealing with the public. So we have taken a decision that we will group persons in surnames A to E, which will significantly reduce the number of persons coming to our centers. So the eligibility criteria will be based on your surname. So walk with your ID card and persons under 60 um, for the time being, don't turn up from tomorrow. Your turn will come as we get more and more vaccines into the country. Um, the vaccine distribution, remember we are doing this now with the gift of 100,000 we did receive from the uh, People's Republic of China. So it's 100,000 being distributed across all sectors, trying to give as many sectors as possible an opportunity to be vaccinated. So supermarkets would have gotten some construction, manufacturing. Um, this weekend, we are doing people like CPEP um, and so on. So we are trying very manfully to be very equitable in our distribution 
And again, I thank the public for their overwhelming response. And you are correct, Kim. Um, the level of vaccine acceptance is phenomenal. I do thank the public for that. But those who don't get vaccinated in this round, I assure you, as more and more vaccines come in, your turn will come. But let's just limit it from tomorrow to those over 60. In the first instance, surname starting from A to E, and then we take it from there in groups of five. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you, Minister. We now go to 98.1. You're ready for your questions. And uh, good morning to you, Mr. Alexander, and um, good morning to the panel, Minister Dial Singh, um, uh, Dr. Hines, and uh, Ms. Bash, uh, Stephen Cummings, 98.1 FM. Uh, just two questions quickly, one for uh, Minister Dial Singh and the other for Dr. Hines. Um, I'll start with Dr. Hines. Dr. Hines, a question has again arose on the vaccine interchangeability, um, which I know... We seem to have a it being froze, frozen. So we'll move to our next um, reporter. We go to the news day. Up to yesterday, no, is that okay, every yes. effort should be made to determine which vaccine the individual received or receives and to complete with the same vaccine. Is that position a preferred recommended approach? Um, because it appears to me that uh, there's still some uncertainty on whether there is safety when it comes to interchangeability. And uh, Minister Dial Singh, the opposition leader has once again raised the issue of the use of the Coover Hospital, um, the question of uh, legality as whether it's, it's, it's legal or illegal. Um, for for government at this time to, to use that uh, facility based on what was um, based on how the, that that institution came into being, I'm, I'm I'm wondering if you can address that issue um, so that there can be some uh, further clarity on that. And of course, we're talking about um, the hospital in relation to uh, the treatment of uh, COVID-19 patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question, Mr. Cummings. Unfortunately, we did miss the bit in the middle, but gathering the gist of the question to be to reinforce whether or not the vaccines are interchangeable, the short answer is no. If you have received the AstraZeneca vaccine as your first shot, then you need to receive the AstraZeneca vaccine as your second shot in order to complete your vaccination and be considered fully vaccinated. And the time frame for that is between 8 and 12 weeks. We are actually looking at giving the second doses on the shorter end of that time frame, the eight-week period, as the CMO said, so that we can have a greater number of fully vaccinated individuals in a shorter space of time. If you've received the Sinopharm vaccine first, then your second shot will also have to be Sinopharm, and this is in a three-week period, so it's a shorter time period. And yes, just to reassure both you and the general public that the type of vaccine received is one of the things that the health system checks prior to administering another dose of vaccine. So we do want to remind the people who are coming for their second shot to work with their cards so that we can verify and validate that you've received either AstraZeneca or Sinopharm and administer as appropriate. So the interchangeability issue does not apply across vaccines. What we have spoken about, however, is the fact that the AstraZeneca vaccine produced by one or another of the WHO approved sites, those are considered equivalent. So AstraZeneca vaccine produced by SII, the Serum Institute in India, or by the SK BioLine Institute in uh, Korea, those are considered equivalent because they're all AstraZeneca, but not across brands. So I'm hoping that if that was the area of uncertainty, that that has been clarified. Thank you. And Mr. Cummins, I want to thank you again for raising the issue. So, there were cabinet minutes, number 570, um, number 1284, dating back to 2018, which cabinet uh, agreed to set up a special purpose company, the Coover Medical and Multi-Training Facility, which comprises a 51% shareholding by the University of the West Indies and 49% by the Government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. The very broad remit of that is to operate the facility. So notice the term, very broad, um, very broad remit. Um, so we look forward 
to turn over all of these documents to the police, as the Honorable uh, Leader of the Opposition has said, and we will take it from there. Um, so that is the authority under which the broad remit, as I said, um, being the operationalization of the facility. And, and we will comply and assist and work with the police, as the Honorable Member um, Kamla Prasad Vicesa has said. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummins. Thank you, Minister. We go now to the news day. Good morning, Marissa Fraser from the news day. This question is regarding an update on um, health professionals going to people who are disabled and the elderly to administer those vaccines. I know that would have um, been implemented in Tobago and it was said that it would happen soon in Trinidad. So we wanted an update on that. Secondly, some people have been suggesting drive through vaccinations that have been happening in other countries. I want to know if the health ministry uh, would at any point consider something like this and explain, I guess, the logistics behind that, because I know you'd have to wait the 15 to 20 minutes for observation. How would that work out in a drive through process? Thanks. Thank you very much for the two questions. So, um, we would have indicated that working through the association that handles the elderly in long-stay homes, we had allocated, based on their recommendations, 1,000 vaccines to that sector. I got an update, or we got an update from the uh, president of the Homes Association yesterday. To date, they have utilized about 750, which is very good because initially the take up the take up was low but once we made the public appeal for the guardians or children of these persons to give consent um, there was a rapid increase so 750 have all doses have already been administered to both staff and residents of long stay homes in talking with miss carolyn ruiz again yesterday uh, she asks for another thousand doses, and once that is available um, in our next shipment, a thousand doses have already been earmarked for the homes for the elderly and so on. The other part, so we are dealing with that. Depending on the inflow of vaccines again, the RHAs will then start to reach out to other vulnerable groups. The shut-ins, we are very concerned about shut-ins you know, those persons who can't come out to uh, the vaccination site. Then, as, I, as, as we said um, recently, we want to target other vulnerable groups, like hopefully the, uh, the blind and so on. So those are in the plans that we have moving forward as we get more and more vaccines into the system. These vulnerable groups are top of mind and they have not been forgotten. They are part of our planning. Thank you very much for the question. 103.1, good morning. We are ready for your questions. Hi, good morning. Are you also on the phone? Could you unmute your mic? We are not hearing you. Hi, good morning. I hear you from a from one of three points. Okay, raise the volume. Uh, my first question has to do with the online system. Some persons are asking about the online system and whether in the future or in the near future, it's going to be reintroduced as some person said that they actually preferred using that method. And my second question has to do with illegal immigrants and what will be done to target these persons. Antigua recently gave their illegal immigrants some incentives to actually come out and get vaccinated. What will be done in Trinidad to be able to deal with that portion of society? Thank you for your two questions. So let's let's go back to the online so we got so many um negative feedbacks about online and whatsapps and so on which was part of the reason we went to this first come first serve system which has created its own problems today um we continue to look at it at other platforms for making appointments and we will look at it on the issue of immigrants it is it is the government's policy we we have a cabinet decision of um June 2019, I believe, that all immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago, regardless of their status, will be eligible for vaccines. 
and this is planned for what we call phase three in the vaccination rollout. That is when we get huge amounts of vaccines. So all immigrants, every soul in Trinidad and Tobago will have access to vaccines. That is government's policy and will be implemented pending the arrival of what we call large commercial quantities of vaccines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, we now go to IETV. Good morning, Binema. Here's some IETV news. I have two quick questions. My first one um, would go to the Minister. Minister, saying that um, there is a very big, huge demand for vaccinations, can you give us an update as to when the next shipment is expected? And my second question would go to Dr. Hines. Um, Dr. Hines, given that the Brazilian variant has been listed um, as the most dominating uh, or the most dominant variant right now at 38%, can you give us um, an estimate of the number of deaths related to that variant? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. So I will deal with the first question first. We don't have um, flight ship, well, let's say flight details yet as to when the next shipment is arriving. As you know, whenever we get that, we always make it public. But right now, we don't have firm confirmation as to when the next shipment will in fact arrive. But as soon as it, it lands, or as soon as we have something certain to say, as we have always done in the past, the media and the public will be informed. Okay, thank you for the second question. It gives me the opportunity to clarify what mm -hmm. may be a misunderstanding in the public domain as a result of the information that was shared and well explained by Professor Carrington. One of the things that I think was missed in that explanation is that the percentage of the samples that we have checked, that we have what we call sequenced, which means looked at the genetic sequence and determined whether it is the original or a variant, the percentage of those samples that is represented by that P1 variant, now called the gamma variant, is not representative of the percentage of the total infections in the population that may be related to that variant. So we cannot use that percentage to say that the variant is dominant and that it's 38 percent. We can see that once a variant enters the population, it establishes some form of equilibrium, meaning that there will be some proportion of the positives that are the new variant and some that are the old version. And while we don't yet have a full uh, estimate of what proportion that is, we do know that in other countries we have seen where the transmissibility of that variant, the ability of that variant to spread from person to person, being a little higher than the original means that it will take up some share of that uh, of the positives some i don't want to use the word market share but it'll take up some proportion we are still in the process of utilizing the limited resources at our disposal to determine what share that really is and with respect to the death so we do not yet have a percentage that would be response that would be as a result of one variant or another the more important thing, however, than which variant is really the fact that the avoidance of infection is not determined by the type of variant. The methods, the mechanisms, the, the, the steps to avoid infection remain the same, irrespective of which variant is in circulation. Maintaining your physical distance, avoiding crowded spaces, keeping your mask on, keeping your hands clean, not going into work or into other gatherings when, uh, when you are ill. Those are the things that are going to prevent spread. Those are the things that are going to reduce deaths. Those are the things that are going to reduce the numbers of cases. And that does not change from one variant to the next. So we do need to maintain focus on those public health measures if we're going to have the success that we need to have in reducing cases and by extension, reducing the deaths. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. We now go to AZP News for their questions. Hi, good morning. Prior Bihari, AZPnews.com. Uh, my first question is just to follow up a little bit on Stephen's question, um, maybe to Dr. Hines. Um, there are persons who may have medical conditions. 
and they may think, you know, based on medical advice, et cetera, that a certain vaccines, whether we have it in Trinidad or not, um, could, could be best suited to them. Um, so therefore they're asking, can, where, can they go to the ministry or someone where they can seek advice and be able to get the vaccine that they think or the ministry advises them to take at this point then? That's my first question. My second question to Minister the Singh Minister, I'm glad um, that you apologize today for, for what happened today because a number of people um, seem to be very hurt. For example, there was um, someone over 60 who spoke to us who said that he went to Kuva facility and, if, and if he bought, and and he couldn't take standing there so long. And he was he was saying that younger people could could stand you know a little longer. So so he's, he's just asking if 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 some better facilities could be in place to take care of the elderly people who are there waiting for the vaccines. You know, um, people some some care should be taken if, if if it can be taken to them who are waiting you know for some time to get a vaccine. Thank you very much. I will answer the second question first. Yes, um, so that person is quite correct because ag again. I am, I am not blaming anybody. It is a reality. We accept responsibility for what happened this morning. Um, so that is why we are putting a cutoff at 60. So what that gentleman had to go through with well under 60 people, um, hopefully will be mitigated from tomorrow. We have asked all CEOs to make our elderly persons as comfortable as humanly possible as we go through this phase of our vaccination drive. So once again, the elderly gentleman to whom you spoke is spot on and that will be rectified, has already been rectified. We have learned um, and we are moving forward at this point in time. Thank you very much, Prior. Okay, and for the first question, the advice that we've been giving to the general population is if you have a medical condition for which you are already receiving treatment, we do advise you to consult with your treating physician with respect to uh, whether the risks outweigh the benefits or benefits outweigh the risks uh, in your individual cases. We do note that across the board, the general uh, comorbidities that people tend to present with hypertension, diabetes, etc., those by themselves in the absence of any uh, instability or in the absence of an uncontrolled state, once you're just hypertensive, diabetic, have those sorts of things going on in the background, the vaccine has been generally deemed as safe for persons with com comorbidities and beyond safe recommended because persons with comorbidities tend to have those more uh, adverse outcomes. So unless there's some special uh, medical condition that you are especially concerned about, then persons with comorbidities are generally advised, yes, go ahead and get your vaccine, but if you have a doubt, then please consult with your treating physician uh, to have those doubts clarified as they have your medical records and the details on your condition and what would be applicable for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Guardian Media, please pose your questions now. All right, morning, everyone. So really quickly, uh, Minister, um, you mentioned that we are going to be doing the surnames begin in fives, right? So A, B, C, D, E. Um, is this going to be tailored at all? Uh, because I'm just thinking some persons with um, certain surnames like Ali and Edwards and those things, those are very common names. So we could run into the issue again of having large crowds turn up. And also does this affect, this new system affect second doses? And now to Dr. Hines, um, I just want to know, do you have a figure for how many children have been infected with COVID-19, specifically newborns and toddlers? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rashad. So um, let's take a second part of the question first. No, this, um, this system from tomorrow doesn't affect second doses. This is just for first doses at the health centers, right? So I hope that clears that up. The second doses are being administered at the five or six mass vaccination sites. The reason being, Rashad, you don't want to have the same center administering two types of vaccines at the same time. Could you imagine what will happen if one person got vaccine A, first dose, and vaccine B, second dose? That creates, so we thought we would sterilize it and have second doses being administered at the mass vaccination sites and 
first doses of Sinopharm being administered in the, um, in the 36 or 37 or so health centers. We are going to um, look and learn as to how this plays out tomorrow because there are some surnames, let's take um, M, Mohammeds. There's going to be a lot of them. So we'll play it by air, but we are doing this in an effort to mitigate what happened today and bring a more ordered, predictable system so persons whose names, surnames, start with A, B, C, D, E, over 60 only, so therefore they will not be competing with the well persons who turned up today. Right? So we, we learn, we accept the responsibility, and we learn. Thank you very much, Rashad. Okay, thank you for your uh, second or first, I'm not sure which order they came in question. I'm going to ask if they can just pull back very quickly the demographic slide, the one on positives. Uh, so we can just take a look at that sort of distribution that we sometimes gloss over. So if you can pull up this slide with the uh, age sex pyramids, the pink and blue, uh, what we will see if we get it to actually display is that the age group that you're asking about, those newborns and toddlers, so I'm going to take toddlers as up to that one to four, although a four-year-old is not a toddler, uh, age group, just for the sake of convenience, you're going to see there that that's actually less than or just about 1% or so overall uh, on, in the males and another maybe 1% in the females. So let's say at most 3% of the total uh, would be accounted for by that age group that you're asking about. So there are, the numbers are quite small. What's more uh, of relevance than the total infections is the total number of cases where there may have been hospitalization or uh, more serious outcomes. And that's information that we can always bring back to the general public via the specialists that, are, that come and share that info and share those updates from time to time from the pediatric department. So that's one of the things that we can do and bring that information in more detail uh, at a subsequent point. Thank you very much. We I'll just sorry. permit me, um, I forgot, one of the earlier um, members of the media asked about dry, driving. Right. Yes, drive, drive through. I forgot to address it. Yes, so the issue of drive through is something being considered, maybe especially for second doses. The chief medical officer um, lays down the, the protocols for vaccines. So what you are noticing now, for the second dose, um, the chief medical officer has advised that we no longer do that prior screening with blood pressure and so on. And the waiting time for second dose, AstraZeneca, has been reduced, every, um, Dr. Hines, from 30 minutes to 20 minutes. So what you are seeing now with second dose will be a faster throughput of patients. So we are considering based on the chief medical officer's advice, how we would operate drive, drive crews. Um, to do that, you will then need a lot of acreage uh, when people have to wait in a car for 30 minutes and so on, and how do you monitor them. But it, 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 it's a possibility we are looking at. And as we move into phase three, when we get larger doses of vaccines, it will be taken not only to all 109 health centers, but villages, um, we are considering malls as we have done in the past with flu vaccination shots and so on. So in phase three, um, predicated on getting large numbers that could be spread not too thinly so you don't run out of vaccines at any one site, that is the plan to bring a vaccine as close as possible to people where they live, where they work, where they congregate, where they go for a maxi taxi, where they shop, right? So that is the um, that is the plan moving forward, and so I'm happy to address the issue of dri drive-ins. Thank you very much, Minister. We quickly go to TV Six. Good afternoon, Renessa Cutting, TV Six News. My questions are for the Minister of Health. Now, given the fact that our healthcare system remains under strain, and also considering this overwhelming response that we saw for vaccination today. Could the ministry say whether it is considering calls from the private sector to assist 
in the management of COVID patients and or the rollout of vaccinations? And if not as well, why not? And my second question is, now that we are moving forward with the alphabetical system, could we have some projections or some targets in terms of numbers as to how many persons the ministry estimates would be vaccinated and by when? Um, especially considering that we would want, we are considering reopening the borders in four to six weeks and or vaccination numbers would, you know, it would be contingent upon that factor. Thank you. So the, the issue of opening the borders is something that the Honorable Prime Minister will deal with. Um, the issue of private sector involvement, they are already involved in helping us get the vaccines to their key target groups. We have already engaged the supermarket association. They started off yesterday. I think they did 900 and something odd, um, and they continue. We have engaged through the supermarket association, the pharmacy board to vaccinate pharmacists and pharmacy attendants. We have already engaged the Trinidad Tobago Manufacturers Association, which was kicked off recently at Diwali Nagar. We have already engaged the Bankers Association as a private sector entity to vaccinate their people. And again, they will take some responsibility for manning the sites and so on. We provide the vaccines. We have already engaged the construction industry through their president to do the same. And we have also engaged the last one, the private security industry. And they will come on stream next week. So we have been in fact engaging the private sector where we provide the vaccines and some logistic support we provide the consumables they provide the site um, they provide the heavy lifting with personnel and so on um, the issue of private sector involvement in the treating of COVID-19 patients as the chief medical officer would have said on Monday there was never any policy that the private sector could not treat COVID-19 patients. They are well within their ambit to treat COVID-19 patients. As the chief medical officer would have said on Monday, what if they choose to send them to our system, and I remember his words distinctly, we are happy to receive them. So there was never any policy or directive that the private sector could not treat COVID-19 patients in their facilities. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Okay, okay so we go to CL Communications. Are you ready for your questions? Good morning, everybody. Nadaline Singh, Caribbean Lifestyle Communications. Uh, these two questions came from the public. Um, they wanted to find out, uh, can organ transplant pe people take the COVID vaccine? And how effective will the vaccine be in these patients who are taking immunosuppressant medication? Thank you. Okay, thank you for that question. That's actually a very good question. And as we just said, what we would do is we would recommend that the treating physicians for those organ transplant uh, patients give them the advice on whether it is uh, safe for them to seek the vaccine. The immunosuppressive aspect of the treatment will to some extent affect their ability to mount an immune response to a vaccine. Some of that, uh, some of that information is still being generated and looked at in the international literature, but short story or short version of the answer, check with your, your treating physicians at this point in time because different people are at different stages, phases, levels, etc. with respect to uh, the treatment, the immunosuppression, etc. and may have the ability to get different bits of advice from the treating physician. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. As we wind down, uh, we go now to I-95.5 FM. Ready for your question. Good morning to everyone with Field Turner N95.5. Dr. Hines, I'm hoping you'll be able to help out in these situations. Um, the first question with respect to the number of deaths from COVID thus far in the country, do you as yet know what percentage of those deaths would have come 
from persons who were in some way vaccinated. And the second question, we had some calls to our newsroom this morning. One lady has a rare disorder that causes fluid in her lungs. I think it's serenomyelia. She wants to know if it's safe to take the vaccines because she asked her doctors and they are not sure. And the second lady who is an elderly woman who is in home quarantine since the 5th of May, she's on antibiotics. She has had COVID three times. She still has it, but the doctors are saying there's nothing more they can do and she's now free to mingle with the population. So they're asking for some advice in these two particular circumstances. Okay, thank you for your questions. However, specific medical advice for specific individuals is not something that we would uh, even attempt to give in a forum such as this in the absence of the information that their individual physicians would have on them on their particular conditions. This is definitely not a forum where specific medical advice for specific conditions will be disseminated. Any queries with respect to how a particular case is managed would be queries that would need to be passed through and managed by the treating physicians. If the treating physicians then wish to seek additional information, they are free to do so, and that, uh, that sort of conversation can happen between the treating physicians and either university, uh, CMOH, ministry, etc. But this is not the forum where specific advice on particular medical conditions or scenarios would be given. Thank you very much. Our last um, representative comes from Rideau Tambran. Okay. Sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Good afternoon. Clayton Clark, Radio Tambrin. Yes. Um, with Phil's question about the number of persons who died, I have asked, intended to ask, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't answered. So I'm asking, is there a record of the number of persons who would have died after taking the vaccine? And secondly, well, Minister, you addressed the whole issue of the long lines, but particularly in Tobago, there are calls for more uh, centers for for doing the vaccines and uh, my my second question really is is it came from a member of the public with the recent developments in the united Amrad emirates with respect to booster shots for sinopharm vaccines being offered after six months is the government monitoring and placing orders either for a third dose or pfizer booster shots to ensure supply is not an issue Thank you. Right, so thank you. I will take the second question and then we'll go to Dr. Hines. So as you know, um, the issue of more centers in Tobago lies squarely under the remit of the Tobago House Assembly, um, Tobago Regional Health Authority. And I am sure that my colleague, the Honorable Tracy Davison Celestin, would have heard your would have heard your intervention and we can look at that. What we do is make sure that Tobago has enough vaccines for their population and we work with them all the time. On the question of uh, a third booster shot, so you were asking specifically about Sinopharm and Pfizer booster shots for Trinidad and Tobago. So let's deal with Pfizer first. We, at this time, we don't have Pfizer in Trinidad and Tobago. So the issue of a third booster shot does not arise as yet. On the issue of Sinopharm, Dr. Hines and his CMO will be able to tell you there is a lot of changing evidence almost on a daily basis as to regards the issuing of a third booster shot. Um, we pay attention to all of these things and when there is firm evidence uh, sent out by WHO or the manufacturers, we will make sure that we stick to establish protocols but as I said as as we see on this platform the the evidence of a third booster shot changes literally on a daily basis and I think um, if memory serves correct the CMO did address this on 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 Monday the issue of a third booster shot okay thank you very much 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Clark, for the question. Thank you for reminding me of Mr. Turner's question, which I omitted. Sincere apologies to Mr. Turner. Uh, with respect to the number of individuals among those deceased who would have received vaccination, so far we only have one uh, individual who we know had a confirmed first dose of vaccine not too long before they actually became ill. And it was sort of in a time frame where the immune response even to the first dose of vaccine wouldn't have had time to kick in and this is uh this is always a risk it's always a possibility that even after you have been vaccinated if you get exposed in the time frame where your immune response hasn't been hasn't had the time to optimize itself you could still become infected and if you have other pre-existing uh conditions that could put you at risk then you could still have an adverse outcome but among the deaths that we have recorded so far, there's only been one such instance. We do, however, want to remind people that once you've been vaccinated and you've had your second shot, it still takes up to two to three weeks thereafter for you to be considered fully protected. And when we say fully protected, it doesn't mean 100%. It means optimal for the vaccine that you've received. But even after your second shot, we still need to encourage all persons to continue with the public health measures, the distancing, the masking, etc., so that we continue to put that breaking force, that slowing force on the spread of the virus through the population. So vaccination by itself doesn't mean, okay, everything just goes back to uh, low levels of precaution. We have to maintain the precautions at this point in time to get the levels of viral circulation down as quickly as possible. Our listeners and viewers, we have come to the end of, our, of today's media conference. Thank you so much for participate, participating and see you next time. Goodbye for now. This is TTT. Live for local.